Uh, hello everyone, I am uh, Zulu Ivan. I am a pre-final year medical student from the University of Boye in Cameroon. And I'm also uh, the head of the communication operation uh, unit in uh, AFAN, Association of Future African Neurosurgeons. It's a pleasure to be here today and to have you all. So today, uh, in today's webinar, Dr. Aminata Sara will be the one to present. But before we get to her, I would like to present uh, a participant. So we we'll start with uh, Dr. Oryx Sidney, please. Can you please? Thanks. I'm Oryx Sidney. I'm a research associate at Program Global Surgery and Social Change. Nice to meet you. Great. Thank you very much. Next is Dr. Kabulo. Please, can you present yourself? Thank you. My name is Kabulo. I'm final year neurosurgeon resident at the University of Zimbabwe. Thank you very much, Dr. Kabulo. Next is. Uh, uh, Shimuka Kumato. Shimuka Kuma, please, could you present yourself? Uh, I'm Shimuka Mulea. I'm a 40 medical student, University of Zambia. Nice to meet you all. Thank you very much, Shimuka. Next on the list is uh, Dr. Alfon Alfonso Lozada. Please, can you unmute yourself and present yourself, please? Dr. Alfonso Lozada, please, can you present yourself? Probably he stepped out. Okay, so next on the list is Dr. Natalie Gomsi, please. Dr. Natalie, can you present yourself? Well, hello, everyone. I am Natalie Gomsi. I'm in program year one uh, uh, neurosurgery uh, in uh, Abidjan. I'm also a, the Secretary General of uh, AFAN. Nice to meet you all. Thank you very much, Dr. Nati. You're welcome. So the next on the list is uh, uh, Janice Joy Fomenki. Please, can you unmute and present yourself? Janice Joy Fomenki, please, can you present yourself? I probably stepped out. Okay, the next is uh, Kiki Shuyu. Please, can you unmute and present yourself? Kiki. Hello everyone, I'm Chuyu Kiki from the University of Zambia. I'm grateful to be there. Thank you very much. Okay, so we are going to, uh, okay, somebody just get in. Please, Alexander, please, could you present yourself? Alexander, please, can you present yourself? Okay, so we next, uh, we move straight to Dr. Aminata. Please, Dr. Aminata, please present yourself and you have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, sorry, your, your microphone is... <laughs> I, I, I tend to leave my microphone on mute because I have, I've, I'm in a child-occupied zone. So I tend to be more on mute than not. <laughs> All right. In any case, um, I'm Aminata Sala. I'm the one who will be presenting today. It's a great honor. Um, to be on this medium um, doing this uh, webinar presentation and um, yeah I'm uh, a bit sad because I was supposed to do it with uh, Dr. Kabulo um, however he is uh, indisposed right now unavailable to do the presentation but he assures me he's with me in spirit and he's going to take all the difficult questions <laughs> <laughs> Are we ready to start? Yes, whenever you're ready, Dr. Sarah. Okay, so I've never done a webinar myself before. I've observed many, so I'm going to try to share my screen. Let's see if I can pull it up. Um, yes. Okay. All right. Um, so, I was tasked to speak on the anatomy of the vertebral disc. Um, uh, as I said before, I'm Aminata Sala. I am originally from the Gambia. I live in Namibia and I train at the University of Zimbabwe. Um, and that's a short story, by the way. Um, I'm in PGY3, the postgraduate um, third year of training um, in neurosurgery. I'm a registrar in neurosurgery. Okay, are you still able to see my screen well? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. 
Okay, so can anybody tell me what they think this is? It looks like a, 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 an ornament from Egyptian antiquity, a uh, beetle. Okay, so I always like to bring presentations back to the landmass of Africa because that's where we are and that's where we are speaking from. And a lot of times uh, the history that we have is, is neglected or ignored and we always have to bring it back to that. So that is why this image is up. And um, this image is the historical note in terms of um, this being a pendant from the tomb of Tutankhamun. And I want to draw your attention to these, these two objects here, which are serpents. And um, the serpent, um, or what was known as uh, Jej or Jet, uh, was the name, was a striking serpent, which represented the uh, spinal column, as you can see there. You see it there, clearly. They took time to make sure they put it in, and you can then see the vertebra and then presumably the discs. Um, and this represents uh, stability. Um, again, you can see the same images if you ever go to Egypt or anywhere in antiquity in that area and you see this type of relief in the temples. This is a representation of the spine. Okay, and that is again called jet or jet. I, again, another depiction on this side, the colorful one with the vertebra and presumably the discs there as well. So this, this symbol represents stability. And um, we also, when we talk about ancient Egypt, we must never neglect, when we talk about medicine, surgery, and ancient Egypt, to talk about the Edwin Smith papyrus, and um, which was presumably, possibly written by Imhotep um, more than 5,000 years ago. And this is supposedly one of the first ever texts that deals with neurosurgical issues um, as far as known history, or recorded history, that is. Here I'm showing again um, what the Egyptians have depicted as the striking serpent um, of Horus, uh, representing stability. Um, and this is the, the spine um, with the intervertebral discs there as well. Um, ignore all the grammar on this side, but it just um, depicts the importance of the spine. So by way of introduction, um, this is our all-important disc. This is something that is much neglected and much passed by in many lectures, and I was delighted to take it on because I said, well, I'd like to get to know the disc a bit better. So um, this is what we're delving into. Um, the bodies of the uh, adjacent vertebra, as you can see here, these are the adjacent vertebra, are held together by the disc, a strong intervertebral disc, which then composes about a third of the height of the spine. Um, they are also held together by anterior and posterior longitudinal ligaments, which you will see later on as we go. Um, there are 23 discs all together. So the discs are shown here in this depiction as well, or a disc rather is, is shown here in the depiction, but this depiction is more to show you, we're going to start from the outside and go in, um, the end plates. Um, the end plates um, are um, hyaline cartilage, they're thin, and um, they are depicted by, sorry, by uh, number three there. Those are the end plates. The components of the, uh, of the discs um, are also shown here again. Um, the three components being the cartilaginous end plates, annulus fibrosus, and the nucleus pulposus. The structure of these um, intervertebral discs is that they transmit the axial load between the vertebra. Um, they also, uh, therefore, uh, take part in transverse bending, um, a lateral movement sagittal in the sagittal and the coronal planes. Um, they uh, give flexibility to the spine, um, enabling the extension, flexion, and torsion. They also dampen high-frequent, high-impact or high-frequency um, stresses that come onto the spine. Um, they, therefore, absorb mechanical energy. Um, the joint is a diarthrodial joint um, between the adjacent vertebrae. And what I like about this image, which is why I chose it, is you can see there, it is not looking as smooth as some depictions make it. You can see the discs right there, the intervertebral disc. This is just an, a quick note on embryology. We're not going to delve into this at all. Um, showing initially, um, beginning of the fetus, um, you have the notochord and the paraxial somites. And as we go along, you see the vertebra being formed and the notochord eventually being punched out and being consumed there and becoming the nucleus. 
um, going into the into the end into the end plates. Um, the end plates are on either uh, at, the, at, at the extremes of the intervertebral disc, and um, they also confer um, stability to that joint. Um, they are made up of two thin layers of hyaline cartilage and measure about one millimeter. Um, they are made up of type two collagen, um, glycosaminoglycans and water, and um, they transversely support the rest of the disc in a form of a sandwich. And um, here we, we're back to our image that, that we had before, showing the end plate again, sandwiching the disc here and um, transversely being a support. It is loosely cemented to the bone here by calcium and um, their collagen fibers, which run horizontally through the end plate, and um, they are parallel also into the intervertebral disc. And then they, they then form part of the disc right there. So, um, and uh, there you also have chondrocytes which maintain the matrix of those end plates. Um, they, have, uh, they have a function of being a barrier, um, which also uh, help to to prevent, sorry, to prevent a bulge, and um, they absorb hydrostatic pressure, they absorb compressive stress from all loads, and there's a semi-permeable membrane there um, in the packed fibers there, and um, whenever we have loss of water, then it can lead, as far as just a clinical note, to a degenerative loss of proteoglycans in the disc, when we have a loss of water through that medium. We're going to the annulus fibrosis. Um, the annulus fibrosis is shown here in this depiction. The annulus fibrosis sort of is on the edges here coming out. You see the end plates with the sandwich. The annulus fibrosis is sort of concentrically arranged. Um, it is, uh, there's a narrow outer collagenous zone and a wider inner fibrocartilaginous zone. Right there, you can see these are wider and these are narrower. And um, the lamina are concentric, as I said before, so they are, they are arranged in circles, one in the other, in the other, in the other. And um, there are about 15 to 25 layers, which are parallel. Um, these fibers lie at about 60 degrees uh, to the horizontal plane, but in some of the texts I read, I've seen 25, I've seen 30, so, um, but uh, 60 was uh, the figure I came across more often. And uh, they alternate in pattern. In, in adding to this stability, um, you can see here in this image, are you able to see the mouse or the, or the, the arrow? Yes, we can see. Okay, additionally, I also tend to speak fast, so if I start racing, somebody slow me down. <laughs> um, you can see here um, that they are opposing each other. They alternate facing left and right, as you can see there. And there are Sharpie's fibers which uh, help to anchor um, the annulus fibrosis there. Sorry, I've gone on too fast. Um, the annulus fibrosis, uh, they also, besides being at uh, 60 degrees to each other, um, they encapsulate uh, the bubble of semi-liquid gelatinous substance we will see in the next slide, which is the nucleus pulposus. And, um, in the annulus fibrosis, in the outer layers, you have a, a fibroblast, fibroblast like cells, which are um, sort of more elongated in, the, in a typical fibroblast style. And as you go further in, um, they become more oval. And um, there also are some cells, fibroblast like cells in between that sort of interdigitate, that have long cytoplasmic projections, um, which people think may have a, sort of a mechanoreceptor function there. So the annulus pulposus is composed of 65% um, water, 55% um, collagen, uh, collagen one and two predominantly, but there's three, five, six, and nine as well. Um, so collagen type one is more, more outer and um, the inner, uh, which uh, has to withstand more compression, um, goes through compression and then restoration is more collagen type two. Um, the demarcation, however, is not distinct, and um, its, it's uh, structure also depends on the nucleus pulposus being intact.
the nucleus pulposus, as we saw earlier, um, is uh, derived from the embryonic notochord. Um, in the embryo, it lies at the center of the disc. However, as uh, time goes on and the vertebral body grows, um, it goes more ventral and lateral. And um, not dorsal because it's the spinal cord is there, as you can see. And um, in the adult, especially in the lumbar discs, it tends to settle closer to the back of the disc instead of in the center. The nucleus pulposus constitutes about 15% of the whole disc. Um, it has approximately 90% of water at birth to 70% at old age. So uh, some of the figures you may see is that it has 80% uh, water. Um, I guess that's an average between the 90 and the 70. Um, there are two types of fiber in the gel. You have a random collagen and um, you have a random collagen and then you have a radial elastin and um, the water content helps to keep it under constant pressure. Um, you also have um, mucoprotein, uh, proteoglycans. I keep wanting to say prostaglandins when I see the, uh, <laughs> I see the PG, but it's uh, proteoglycans, um, which constitute 75%. And uh, these mucoproteins imbibe and retain the water that is in the nucleus pulposus. Um, the nucleus pulposus uh, helps to dis distribute um, hydraulic pressure um, and uh, therefore it goes in all directions on the compression, as you can see here. So it gets distorted. Um, the biomechanics um, of this, of the intervertebral disc are very important, but that's a, an entire lecture of its own for another day. We just touch lightly on it in, because we cannot avoid it. Um, so you can see there, it's not distorted in this case and with the pressure, it becomes distorted and then goes in, uh, to all directions um, the cells in the nucleus pulposus um, are of a low density. You not that the cells themselves are not dense, but there are not many cells in it. It is not dense with cells, um, and they are chondrocyte-like. Um, these cells maintain and uh, repair the matrix of the nucleus pulposus. Um, importantly, if the nucleus pulposus um, herniates, herniates uh, through the annulus for any reason, um, most likely it will happen posteriorly. Um, it will then press on the roots of the uh, spinal nerves or the spinal cord, and um, it, it, that can bring problems. Uh, the proper composition of the nucleus pulposus ensures hydration, and it also allows for the function of this very important part of the intervertebral disc. Um, here we have, uh, coming up, another image showing the distribution of the pressure. Um, where it's distributed in all directions, as I mentioned before, to help to bear any load or stress on the um, spinal column. The nucleus pulposus, just a few terms that you need to know about it, is um, there's imbibation, um, uh, and through imbibation uh, of water, um, there's an overnight increase in the height of a young adult by about one centimeter. So when we go to bed tomorrow morning, we'll all be one centimeter taller, depending on whether you want to be taller or not, that could be a good thing. And um, while you're upright during the day, um, this water gets squeezed out. Excuse me while I drink some water so I can maintain my nucleus pulposus. Um, the water gets squeezed out. And um, in old age, um, there's little height change at that point between the, the night and the morning. Um, as the imbibation becomes less, uh, the nucleus then becomes more fibrous. And um, another point of note uh, is that um, in astronauts, due to the lessening of gravity when they leave the atmosphere of the Earth, their height actually increases by several centimeters. So if you feel you are short and you can't go through any procedures to become taller, become an astronaut. Here is another image just to show um, all the elements um, that we met uh, in our discussion of the intervertebral disc so far. Um, you can see the comparison. Um, of course, as we expect, there's more water in the nucleus pulposus being um, semi-liquid, uh, gelatinous or semi-gelatinous, depending on how you look at it. Um, having more water, 77% water, vis-a-vis -vis the 70% in the annulus fibrosus, and then the end plate being even more fibrous than having 55% of water. Um, we then have here the collagen. You can see collagen in the end plates being 25% there and 15% um, um, going down as we go further up. 
in the annulus fibrosus, and then only 4% in the nucleus pulposus. Um, proteoglycan, 14% in the nucleus pulposus, 5% um, in the annulus fibrosus, and 8% in the cartilaginous end plate. So we now go on to discuss uh, the nutrition of the intervertebral disc. Um, the nutrition, as you can see, um, here is from the vertebral blood vessels, the segmental ones can come in. And um, initially, the, there are tiny vessels in the end plates, up to when a person is, is about, uh, for three decades that is, so up to when you're about 30 years old. Um, then they disappear. And um, then you may uh, start to develop all kinds of problems. They scar, they disappear and become avascular. Um, the outermost um, uh, parts of the annulus can manage to get um, some irrigation from the soft tissues or from any vessels that are close by. Um, however, the innermost ones may suffer um, because they depend on diffusion. And so you really have to make sure you keep yourself very well hydrated and in good spine health. This is showing again the center, um, metabolites and nutrients. When the metabolites are low, nutrients being high and vice versa, going up there, you can see where it is red, you have high nutrients, low metabolites, where it is yellow, you have high metabolites and low nutrients. This is just a depiction of lactic acid. Of course, lactic acid is not liked anywhere. Um, so you can see that whenever you have a, a low oxygen, low glucose, then the lactic acid levels are also high. And this is a critical point, which is to be avoided. A mention of the um, anterior longitudinal and posterior longitudinal ligament, they are not, uh, of course, part of the intervertebral disc per se. However, um, they, they do uh, line and delimit the area and are attached to the intervertebral disc. The, just a word on each of them, the uh, anterior longitudinal ligament uh, uh, begins from the base occiput of the skull and goes all the way to the anterior tubercle. Um, of the atlas, sorry, goes on, and the anterior tubercle of the atlas rather, to the front, all the way to the front of the upper sacrum. Um, it is firmly united to the periosteum of the vertebral bodies and loosely or less so over the intervertebral discs. Uh, it is a flat band, uh, gradually broadening as it passes downwards. This is again a depiction because it shows very well um, it's a simple, simple graphic, but it shows all the elements we are looking at. Uh, you can see here number four being the anterior longitudinal ligament right there, delimiting the disc there, and the posterior longitudinal ligament right there as well. So the posterior longitudinal ligament, um, it it uh, delimits. Uh, as I said, the posterior part, and it extends um, from the back of the body of the axis to the anterior wall of the upper sacral canal. And um, opposed to the anterior one, it narrows gradually as it passes downwards and it has serrated margins. Um, it is broadest over the discs to which it is firmly attached, and um, it is narrow over the vertebral bodies um, where it is more loosely attached, as opposed to the anterior one. Um, it gives free exit to the basic vertebral uh, veins which emerge, emerge rather from the back of the bodies and um, at the top it continues above the body of the axis as a tectorial leg, as a tectorial membrane rather. Um, we can see here that uh, the discs have an elegant design. Um, they dissipate the axial forces, they dampen high frequency events, they give us bending ability and they have a special design which uh, unfortunately then Makes, them, makes us, makes them and us susceptible to debilitating deformities and to pain. As far as just a clinical, clinical note, um, they can be affected by aging, by degeneration, by disease, um, by stress, not stress as in, you know, I'm stressed out, but by, by loading it by, in, a, in a sense of physics, that kind of stress. I suppose uh, all your ordinary level of stress or, or, or rather your, what we usually refer to as stress could indirectly affect you, of course, but um, this is speaking uh, strictly about loads. Um, you can also have what are called advanced glycation end products um, that occur um, in the discs. 
and uh, that is associated with degeneration, but that is still under study, and um, we, don't know, we don't understand them very well yet. Um, we can also have uh, end plate calcifications, which can affect um, the uh, semi-permeable uh, feature of this, um, not allowing uh, enough um, molecules or materials to pass through and uh, go on to the nucleus pulposus and the annulus fibrosus. And uh, decreased blood flow can also affect the intervertebral discs. Um, a few common problems that can occur. Now, I was not going to talk too much about clinical since we were talking mostly about the anatomy. Um, uh, Dr. Kabulo had promised he was going to do that, but I will give a few points and um, he may add uh, any additional ones or anybody else out there, or that might be a lecture for another day. Um, you can have, as you can see at the very top, you have the normal disc um, going down. It's depicting the bulging disc. Um, so I excuse the spelling here, that is wrong. As uh, a herniated disc, uh, this O should be an I. Um, you can see a degenerative disc um, and also a thinning disc. Um, this is an MRI depiction of, of a disc. You can see the healthy disc. Um, I'm not sure that I can say you see the end plates, but you can, with an, with an, with an eye of faith, see the end plates. Um, we have uh, the annulus fibrosus, and this being the anterior side. Uh, this is a, a depiction of a healthy disc. Um, you see the nucleus pulposus there, and um, in the healthy disc, and then the annulus fibrosus. What I like about this image and why I put it there was so that you could actually see the concentric lamellae right there. Um, they are visible in the MRI, and I think that's beautiful and instructive. Um, it was for me anyway. Um, with early degeneration, you can see how the nucleus pulposus is getting reduced. Um, you can see the buckling of the fibers of the annulus fibrosus. Um, you can see the thinning out of the disc itself overall. It's, it's width right there. It's, it's getting less and less. Um, it's, it's, it's width, um, I neglected to mention, um, I, I was supposed to earlier on, um, in the lumbar area can go up to as high as um, 14 millimeters. Um, and uh, so it, it becomes shorter, leading to all sorts of problems or less wide. And at the end, you can see with advanced degeneration, of course, of the disc, what then happens to the disc. Um, as far as uh, the disc herniation we mentioned, um, there are various stages of a disc degeneration where you have a, a normal disc. Um, you have uh, the disc uh, initially starting to degenerate, um, then you have the prolapse, um, you have the extrusion, and then you have the sequestration. And um, this is all you can see here, it relates to the neck of the pathology here. When it's sequestered, um, uh, portions of the nucleus are entirely just out, and um, they are sequestered away as, as the name suggests. And um, that was all I had for you today. Um, I say thank you in English, Jerejev in Wolof and Jarama in Fulani. Um, and uh, I am available for any questions. I'm trying to work this here to see if I can put on my video. Okay, thank okay. you very much, Dr. Aminata. Thank you so much for your presentation, wonderful presentation. So uh, you give the floor to the panelists. Uh, is anybody having a question? If yes, question or comment, you just uh, speak it out. Thank you very much. So yes, Shimuka, yes, Shimuka, you have the floor, you can speak, go on. Yes, I wanted to find out, are there any variations to the observations that you make when it comes to children and any anomalies like uh, special differences that you will be able to notice? I don't understand your question. Uh, Can you repeat it? it? I mean, when it comes to children, like since they are still developing, is there any difference in observation when it comes to MRI observations? In, in MRI children? observation of children? Um, yes. No, I didn't come across that specifically, but as a general rule, their discs tend to be healthier than adult discs definitely, because in the first three decades of life, um, we have uh, all of the irrigation and nutrition or nourishment of the disc is there. 
and uh, degeneration tends to occur as you get older. So one would expect that one would have healthier and um, more normal discs in children and less, less fibrous, more cartilaginous. All right, thank you. Uh, Dr. Kabulo, would you like to add something there? Hello? Hello, Dr. Kabulo? Yes, hello. I'm privileged what was to have the question? Please what's remind me. Um, he's asking uh, about changes or differences in children's discs vis-a-vis -vis those of adults. And um, what I said was that um, uh, in the first three decades of life, uh, the discs tend to be more normal. They are well irrigated. They have enough water in them. Um, but then as you get older, they degenerate. And one would expect that in children, you would tend to have intact, healthy discs where children are normal with normal nourishment and um, normal adequate amounts of water. You should have normal discs with normal height vis-a-vis -vis adults or older. Yeah, you, sure. That? No, nothing to add. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, any, any person with another observation or question? Um, thank you, Dr. Aminata, for the, present, the brilliant presentation with the, the African history, uh, the year history, actually. Uh, I wanted to just, I know that, that I don't know if um, it may be a little chapter about the biomechanics of, um, of, the, of the disc that maybe a little bit helped us because sometimes we uh, we don't really um, uh, know how to prevent degeneration of this apart from drinking water obviously but there are usually positions maybe minor positions even sitting on a on a desk while working normal position you have to think not to uh, to, in, in, in order not to uh, accelerate the degeneration of your disc. Uh, I say that because at some point you said um, the nucleus proposes is usually at the center, but uh, with age, it's, it, 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 it becomes... It, becomes uh, it shifts, yeah, more posterior. Yeah, it shifts. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's not because of the positions that we take uh, that with age, the nucleus proposes uh, is found to get shifted behind or... Well, certainly that makes sense. If you think of, again, the biomechanics, as you said, and there, there's a lot to the biomechanics of this, which I didn't go into as I was tasked with the anatomy, but um, because that's more of the physiology, um, although I touched on it. As you said, it is, it's logical. Um, if you think of um, the flexion that we do, um, of course, the nucleus pulposus would have a tendency to want to move in that direction. Um, and uh, in terms of... Uh, uh, thank you for bringing up um, safe positions and good spine health. I, I did uh, say a word about that, just a word. Um, as for spine health, um, even for lifting, there are positions in which you should lift um, in terms of squatting to lift as opposed to trying to bend down to take a heavy load in terms of the physics of it. I mean, the annulus pulposus, I mean, sorry, annulus fibrosus and the nucleus pulposus and the end plates um, are very strong and um, they undergo much distortion. However, they have limits. And where you don't have good muscle bulk to help to support you, and you have not been drinking enough water, and you are getting older, you don't have enough um, uh, irrigation and nutrition for your intervertebral discs, and you then practice unhealthy um, activities such as lifting, lifting in the wrong way, um, or twisting in unnatural positions, you will then be liable to, to have uh, injuries. Sorry. Thank you for... Uh, the question was, why when you are getting old, the disc is going posterior, isn't it? Well, she was asking whether the position, the movements that we make also tend towards the pulposus moving itself backwards. Okay. So I was saying, yeah, okay, that's a possibility. And then she talked about spine health and healthy spine behavior, and then that's what I was just speaking to. Okay. What else is yeah. allowing the disc? Why is it uh, most frequent to get uh, the disc going back than uh, anteriorly? Well, because, um, of the because of the ligaments, the way yes. the ligaments are attached. Yes. This is what is allowing it to go. I'm trying to find the image. I had an image that shows it very well. Let's see if I can find it. Okay, this could be one. 
So you can see the ligaments there, the anterior ligament and the posterior ligament. So we said it moves, tends to move posterior and laterally. And you can That's see. Not, but I'm not a share your, share your screen again. Oh, I'm sorry, the screen, sharing has gone. We, oh, we can sorry. see it. No, no, yeah, no the brother is we just down see. there. Ah, okay. Ah, okay. Yeah, I can see it. <laughs> sorry, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, I had a problem. <laughs> Trying to see if there's a different one. Uh, no, I think that's the best one I have to do to, to show that. Yeah, so that it goes more posterior laterally because anteriorly, it is not able to come out here. It goes more posterior laterally because that's the point of least resistance. And additionally, again, because of the movements as well. Dr. Kabulo, anything else you'd like to add to that? No, you are, you are right. You see that posterior longitudinal ligament is. Yeah not wider like the anterior yeah. one so it yeah. is just taking the small area and in the lateral aspect there is no ligament there that's where you tend to have more discrimination in the lateral posterior lateral than uh, posterior central mm. then i have another question <laughs> is there yeah. um, uh, yes, Dr. Natalie. Considering where, considering where the, 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 the disc is situated, whether it's the vertical, dorsal, or lumbar, is there, how can I say, on this, uh, the, oh, one second. is there, a, how can I say, a risk? Why is it that there's much more uh, degenerative or herniations on cervical or lumbar than, than dorsal? Um, that has because to of the motion. Okay, go ahead. It's okay. Get on the. Go ahead, button. boss. No, no, go ahead, boss. <laughs> <laughs> you can start. <laughs> okay, I will start. Um, it has to do with with it's again the biomechanics. It's the loading, and um, if you look at, for instance, um, where um, the um, the L five L five S one junction is, um, that's an area. Uh, where you have a lot of motion and um, that tends to have a lot of um, disc herniations and problems there. Um, it has to do with the, the types of movements that you do there. Um, in the thoracic region, for instance, it is fixed. You have the ribs and uh, much movement is not allowed as far as flexion extension. Um, the body does not allow that. Um, so it has to do, and, and if you think of the head as well, um, most of us, I'm sure you practice uh, good phone health. You never bend your head and look down at your phone while you're walking. You're not always on your phone looking down. Your head is always up. Um, the weight of the head um, on, on, the, on the neck, on the, in the cervical area, also causes a lot of problems. And, and just in terms of our daily living, the types of movements we do um, with our neck, if you think of people who put their phone here and you know, bend their head, to meet their shoulder. All those sorts of, of, of challenges and stresses in the cervical region and in the lumbar region will lead to that. Uh, both? Well done, Dr. Minata. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, sir. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, thank you, Dr. Minata. It means thank that you, I think that a, another course on the biomechanics of the of the letter by this will be very will be very important for our course right, for this course, right? Absolutely. The biomechanics are, are very important. They're essential. And they're deep. Thank you, Dr. Minata, for that excellent presentation. Uh, can you show us the last diagram? Okay. Yes, yes here. Yeah. Yes. So they are... Of course, it's just a diagram. Uh, when we are talking about sequestration, it yeah. means the disc is now is detached to the, the part of the herniated nucleus is yeah. detached completely to the uh, rest of the disc, and it's mm -hmm. behind the vertebral body. Yes. Then you say sequestration. But mm -hmm. if it is like separated and not behind the vertebral body, we say extrusion. Extrusion. Disc okay. extrusion. Yes, there is disc protrusion and disc extrusion. I think I will talk more uh, about this when I'll be talking about classification of intervertebral disc herniation. So I will go in details about that. Extrusion, mm -hmm. protrusion, disc bulging, disc prolapse, and so on. So, um, 
I have two small questions for you, Dr. Minata. The first one. I'm sure your questions are never small. End plate. <laughs> end plate. <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> they are always small ones. Thank you. Yeah. The, the first one. Uh, do you think end plates are part of the disc or part of the vertebral body? That's one. Ah, that's, this is a controversial. One, okay, go ahead. Uh, sorry. No, go ahead. It's okay. Okay, the second one. Uh, is the intervertebral disc vascular? Because I saw okay. one of the diagram showing arteries coming from anterior and posterior aspect to the disc. Hmm. Is it okay. vascular um, or a vascular structure? Okay. Um, so uh, the first question was the end plates. Are yes. they part? Are they part of the disc? That is a subject of controversy, actually. Um, some books said they are, and some books they said they are not. However. Um, there are, there are uh, calcium connections um, uh, between the end plate and the vertebra, and um, they are considered really to be part of the disc. Um, so there is, a, there is a connection. Let me see if I can, um, so I can do it here. Um, th there, are, there are collagen fibers which come from the end plate and, and string along like this parallel and then go back up that anchor the end plate to the annulus fibrosus. And that is how they are held there. However, they are applied as well to the vertebral, but they are considered part of the intervertebral disc from my reading. Okay. That's, uh, that's the, most of the uh, others. Okay. Yes. Oh, you, can, you want to okay. answer the no, second no, one? No, or you, you can correct me on this one first. Okay. <laughs> 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 most of the others are saying in end plate the end plate of the vertebral bodies. Yes. So they are part of the vertebral bodies. Yes. Okay. Not part of the disc. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Then you can carry on for the second question. Yes, I want to bring, the, I'm looking for the image for us to discuss it. I want to show it. Okay. So that's the image. Um, this is from uh, what I understood from the image when I looked at it initially is that it is not coming anterior and posterior, it is lateral. This, okay. this, this source is lateral, and um, these are vertebral blood vessels, and they're coming from the segmental blood vessels. And um, the, initially, it is vascular, but just at the periphery. And after the third decade, it becomes avascular. So it is, it is one of the most, one of the least, the most avascular, one of the least vascular structures in the body. This is my understanding. It's okay. So it's the biggest uh, vascular structure of the body, the intervertebral. Yes. Yeah. Then uh, let us say the, the nutrients are coming from where? You said, you, said, you said two questions only. Is this a third one? <laughs> 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 three. Yeah, I mean, there's like that. that one. <laughs> <laughs> How do you call those small arteries going to the end plate? The small arteries going to the end plate? Yes. Because um, just after that, when the disc is now a vascular, the yeah. nutrients are coming now from those small arteries supplying the end plate. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, how do you call them? I just, I just know them as nutrient vessels. I don't yes. call them by another. Metaphysial artery. Metaphysial, okay, yeah. Yeah, metaphysial artery. That's like from where uh, the disc is getting nourished from those okay. arteries. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Metaphysial arteries. So yes. the nourishment um, is it by, by diffusion or? Yes, know, by diffusion, yes. Initially not, yes. but later on, yes. Yes, later on, yes. Uh, the last question. Or further in, will, further in. Yes. yes. <laughs> it will be after. after 30, it's diffusion only. Except for the outermost aspects, which can yes. still steal, steal some nourishment from any vessels or soft tissue lying around. Otherwise, it's a vascular. The further you go in.
Okay, any other question? Chimuka? Yeah, Dr. Kablo, I have a question. Yes, my brother Marvin. Yeah. Chimuka, you have a very famous name. We have a very, an excellent yes. uh, professor of cardiology, yes. cardiothoracic <laughs> surgery in uh, Zimbabwe. So your yes. name strikes uh, fear and awe in everybody. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, I'd like to thank Dr. Aminata for the great presentation and let her know uh, I'm one of her juniors at uh, Edinburgh. Oh, wonderful. So, I'd like to come back to the question concerning the, the end plate. Uh, yes. Well, I think some authors consider the cartilaginous uh, end plate as being part of the the disc, so they, they do the, they make a difference between the cartilaginous end plate and the end plate of the vertebral body. Mm -hmm. okay. Also, you mentioned the. Depends on the author you read, huh? But uh, because we are uh, at Kabulo, Dr. Kabulo is my boss uh, in Zimbabwe. Whichever text he's reading is the one I have to read, and therefore he's right. <laughs> you know, let us discuss, okay? <laughs> okay. Yes, Marvin? Yeah, the second thing I had was, uh, you mentioned the irrelevant anatomy of the, nucle of the vertebral disc, explaining the, why we often have uh, posterior Ignition rather than anterior. Well, another reason to what you, you gave is that uh, the annulus fibrosis uh, anterior fibers are more thicker and stronger than the posterior one. That's one of the reasons some authors give to, to explain the fact that mostly have posterior. Uh, Posterior ignition. Um, yeah, I, I want to yeah. also say if you look at the, the um, as uh, Natalie was saying, in terms of the compression that occurs in terms of, of flexion, etc., um, and also if you think of the lordosis, etc., and where the weights are, um, it, it tends to logically move in that direction in addition to everything else that's been said. Thank you very much for the question and answering session as well as the comments. It was really uh, wonderful. I have a question, uh, Dr. Aminata. So mm -hmm. uh, for, uh, in the treatment of uh, lumbar disc uh, herniation, uh, which, uh, like, um, which is the best treatment modality for lumbar disc uh, um, herniation? Is it going to be um, co uh, conservative or non-operative management or is a surgical management which is the best between the two? Uh, that depends on the patient. That is, that is not a, a, an easily answered question. Um, it depends on the symptoms the patients have. The patients have. You can look at different um, imaging modalities and see really terrible looking spines and the patients have no symptoms and vice versa. Um, so uh, I will let Dr. Kabulo, um, I will ask Dr. Kabulo rather to please come in and um, augment to this question um, because um, he was going to deal more with the pathologies. However, um, there are many, actually and in this day and age, there are many treatments coming up. Um, there's conservative management um, for the patient that, uh, you know, doesn't have that many symptoms, their discs are not too unhealthy, um, etc. Uh, and there are other there are, op there are operative treatments. There are there are fusions. There are um, discectomies, partial, complete discectomies. That I don't want to steal into somebody else's territory. Those are all um, modalities of treatment. And then there are the latest treatments. There are the factors that that you can use. Um, people are using um, mesenchymal stem cells. People are using scaffolds um, to then grow these cells on. Um, uh, to create a new, an entirely new disc with a greater or lesser success. Um, but actually for us, and in Africa, we have to leapfrog and pay much attention to these types of things um, because we cannot go through all the stages of evolution, so-called evolution, 
or growth that everybody has gone through. We have to leapfrog to the front of the line. So there are things like the scaffolds. Um, there is, uh, and I meant to actually put one, but um, I neglected to do so. I meant to do so. I was going to put in an artificial disc for disc replacement. And this you tend to put in uh, for young patients, especially instead of doing fusions, when um, you have tried all modalities and it's the end of the road, there are artificial disc replacements and there are beautiful uh, uh, disc types out there that um, can, be, can completely replace um, the, uh, the disease disc. Um, boss, can you come in please? Dr. Kabulo. If, if Dr. Kabulo is not um, available, um, okay. just that's just that's, that's what I have to say. Sorry, my, my internet connection is bad. I didn't even get very well the question, but I had the explanation from Dr. Minata. What was the question? He Zoro? was asking about treatment modalities for disc herniations and in whom should it be conservative and in whom should it be, um, you know, surgical or non conservative. And I was saying that it depends on the patient. You, well, you heard the explanation, so you heard all that. Yeah, it depends uh, on the patient. Uh, before, we usually start with conservative management. Uh, you give uh, some drugs and you do physiotherapy. Lifestyle, patient, the patient has to change his lifestyle, uh, like uh, reducing uh, to lift the, the weight and uh, yeah, whatever they can tell him to physiotherapy. And if it fails, usually they give margins. It's controversial. People are saying after three months, others are saying, but in our center, we use after six months of conservative management. If it fails, then you go for surgery. You operate the patient. So that's how we, we, we proceed. Um, Thank you very to, much. Yes. Zolo, to, ju just to, to your question, um, I think that that in itself is, uh, okay. oh, the future okay. neurosurgeon, hello. Uh, I, I think that in itself is uh, it is a whole lecture of its own. But um, long, long um, story short, in terms of spine treatment, if you have fifty spine surgeons, you have one hundred treatment proposals. Just keep that in mind. Um, it differs whether you are in front of an orthopedist, a orthopedic surgeon, or a neurosurgeon. And even neurosurgeons have so many schools. It's all over the place i mean you, you will hear so many things but um ho hopefully we get uh, a lecture on like the basics of spine management and then you can build from that thank thank you very much everybody for the sure. comment. Uh, thank you dr ilrick uh, <laughs> for that. Uh, in neurosurgery we have many schools it's like what we are discussing about end plate we are saying cartilaginous yeah. end plate and whatever and I was saying, that's why we do, when we are doing a discectomy, you remove the disc, then we have to remove the end plate. When you are removing the disc, the end plate doesn't come with the disc. You have to remove it now from the vertebral body with your curette, then you remove that end plate. You see, so there are many schools and uh, especially anatomy, people are going deeper, others are still like this. Then you have to, to see where you are and what they are teaching you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So, is there any other question or comment? Yeah, I Sydney. Say, say I in have terms one. Bula was just saying now, and maybe it's not either or. Sometimes it's both. Um, that is a very masculine approach. You see, Natalie, not so. Um, men yeah, will like yeah. to come camp. It is this and it is that. No, we will fight about it. We will disagree. Maybe it's both. Maybe it's part of the of the, the vertebral body and it's also part of the disc and it's all a nice happy yeah. union and we all get along together as a nice happy family. Okay. Yes. Doctor, yes. Doctor Kennedy. Yes. You had a question. A comment. Doctor Kennedy you had a question. I comment. Yeah. Yeah. yeah sure. 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 <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Go on, Dr. Kennedy. I really have bad uh, internet. I don't know where they can be had. Yeah, you are getting you. Yeah, okay. Well, first of all, congratulations, Dr. Minata, for adding a feather to your hat. Thank you. And, uh, yeah, 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 and uh, a great presentation was short and sweet, but uh, uh, just a quick one. Could you comment on... Uh, uh, 
I mean, the anatomy that we've learned, the blood supply and everything. Could you possibly uh, mm -hmm. comment on uh, the pattern of destruction in in uh, TB vis-a-vis -vis pyogenic infections, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, metastatic lesions, and what we normally see uh, on imaging and you know uh, when I mean practical enough uh, in the world. I think it's a very good question. Um, but as far as TB goes, um, I hadn't delved into that as that was not the, the, the thrust of this presentation. Um, what I do know that with, with, uh, with, with, with Malda Pot, uh, you, will have, um, uh, you will have caseations and you will have um, cavitations within the vertebra um, that are erratic because it's TB. Uh, and um, these can cause all sorts of problems, again, depending on, on where they are, depending on whom they are, and you will then also have collapse of the vertebra, etc. cetera. Um, and um, yeah, so I'm not sure exactly what you're looking for, but as far as general remarks, that had way, that's what I can say. Uh, perhaps, uh, there's more that you're looking for, and then Dr. Kabulo can speak to that. But we are going to uh, have a presentation on on um, diseased or disease of pathology of the um, of the discs. Ah, okay, of the okay. Spine. If it's coming, okay, then that's you. fine. I think I, I think I was looking more towards uh, you know early on there are those that spare the disc, then others involve the disc, and the uh, possibly the hypothesis that possibly explains that. Well, please, please share it with. That, you seem to be ready for that. Dr. Kennedy, which one spares the disc between TB and MET? Is he still there? I, I, yeah, I'm here, I'm here. I think TB spares the disc initially. Yes, initially. Then after that, the disc will be affected. When you get a fracture of the vertebral body, the disc might be affected also. Now, Especially in pyogenic infection, what is going on is about the arteries. I was asking Dr. Aminata, those metaphysical arteries. You get septic emboli to those arteries. Then the disc won't get uh, the nutrient and it will be desiccated. You get discitis. The discitis is always starting by uh, inflammation of the metaphysical artery, a uh, meta end plate, sorry starting on the end plate so the pathophysiology is when you get infection you get infection around the spine which is going now to the spine it's just you get they are throwing the septic emboli to go and obstruct those small arteries the metaphysical arteries but if you get now this the, the tb the vertebral bodies because they are vascular they get affected then at the beginning the discs are spared then after that, they will be also affected. But with MET, metastasis disease, you can also get even the disease affected at the beginning. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Kabulu. Uh, I don't know if yeah, somebody so has much. a comment. OK, cool. Yes, I have, I have a comment to make. <clears throat> I want to thank everybody for all your kind words and um, goodwill. On hold on, hold on, Dr. Minata, please. Hold on, hold on. <laughs> Hold on first. Hold on. Hold on. Okay. Uh, before you start, before you start thanking us. So, if everyone didn't know, if everyone, I hope everyone knows, Dr. Minata is now uh, an MSc from the University of Edinburgh. So, we're going to have a virtual graduation ceremony because <laughs> let's have some graduation music and a round of applause on mute and clap for her. <laughs> We're very proud of you. Yeah, proud of you, proud of you. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. I, I, nearly, I nearly gave up many times and I nearly postponed again. And thanks to Dr. Kabulo who told me, no, 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 you cannot go, 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 go and finish uh, because your exams in Zimbabwe are waiting for you. So I, uh, I proceeded on and went on to finish. And um, yeah, as I was saying, I thank everybody for the support and the goodwill. And um, it's really nice to have a supportive community. Um, it, it makes one feel, um, feel better, especially when we are all disseminated, to use Dr. Kabulo's word just now, 
um, we feel a sense of community and, and um, belonging. And thank you very much again. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Congratulations. Congratulations, Dr. Congratulations. Okay, You're yeah. a great yeah. example. Yeah. And we yeah. hope um, the others will and follow. I, hope, you know, I wrote my thesis yeah. while I was fasting. I was fasting Ramadan oh. while I was writing my thesis. It was very difficult. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, opening, yeah, opening, yeah, opening yeah, us. Uh, on, you know, putting putting on my keyboard. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, opening of views that the uh, that I mean, that, as I said earlier, that, that was just what I would try to do. And then who knows, having you, I'll, I'll have already somebody who won, and then they'll just say, okay, since Dr. Aminata was there, uh, why not try this girl? Uh, you so, can do it. Absolutely. I encourage you. I encourage yeah. everyone to do it, especially Thank if you. we're going to academia. We need to um, prepare ourselves for that. And um, yeah, why not? Dr. Aminata will be a professor soon. Ah. Ah. Maybe, maybe when you promote me, sir, <laughs> you will be a professor first. <laughs> thank you. And thank you for the opportunity. I've really enjoyed the presentation. I myself have learned a lot because there are areas of the body that you just neglect as you go along. And it was an opportunity to learn more about uh, one of those corners. Yeah, we learned a lot also. Mm -hmm. from your presentation. Thank you. Thank you.